as you find your way to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, right there in, uh, uh, in your New Testament. Hebrews just after Philemon, just before James. Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. And this morning we're going to begin a four-part series of studies that I'm entitling Angels and Demons, What the Bible Really Teaches. And here's what we're going to do over the next several weeks, the next four weeks actually, we're going to dig into and discover what the Bible has to teach about the reality and the ministry and the activity of angels in our life. We're going to begin this morning by looking at the presence of angels. Angels are all around us. And then we're going to study the personality of angels. What are angels like? What do they look like? What do they do? And then we're going to investigate to see if we indeed have a personal, what some would call a guardian angel. I heard about a guy who was walking home one day, and he heard this voice from uh, above him say, Stop! Don't take another step! Don't move! And he didn't. And all of a sudden, I mean, from some work spot up above him, this great big cinder block just fell and hit that very next step that he would have taken. And what it would do, it would have killed him. And he's like, wow, that's something. He's walking along a little bit further and all of a sudden he hears this voice again. And the voice says, stop right where you are. Don't take another step. And he stopped and a, a bust, I mean, just flew right uh, in front of him. I mean, it would have made him just a crispy, I mean, just an oily spot right there in the middle of the road, right? He said, who are you? And the voice says, well, I'm your guardian angel. I'm, I'm here to watch over you and take care of you and protect you, keep you from getting in trouble. He said, that's great. Where were you on my wedding day? <laughs> and then we're going to look at, spend one Sunday studying what the Bible has to say about the perverted angels, what, what we often call fallen angels or demons today. So when, whenever you begin to talk about and think about the study of angels. You, you've got people that are going to fall, really they're going to approach it from the subject and the study of angels from one ditch or another. On one side, there is obsession. Angels are everywhere. Angels in the outfield, the infield, the dugout, I mean everywhere. They, they, they have pictures and paintings of angels, anything and everything they can get their hands on that's related to angels, they want it. Uh, they read about angels, they watch movies about angels, they listen to songs about angels, they love angels angels. They've been touched by an angel, kissed by an angel, blessed by an angel, and they even know that every time a bell rings, yeah, an angel gets its wings. You know that too, right? Our very first church in the hinterlands of West Tennessee, Gateway Baptist Church out northeast of Memphis in a token Brighton, uh, we, uh, Kim and I weren't married yet. We were still students at Union University and, uh, but we, God had called me to pastor this church. It's about two hours away. And, uh, so we would go to school during the week. And then on Saturday we would drive down and we would stay with a couple called the Davidsons. Kim got a really nice room downstairs and I got this attic, uh, room upstairs. And Janice Davidson had, the only way I know how to explain this, she had a fetish for angels. She loved, she was crazy about angels. I mean, she had everything you can think of, cups with angels on them, figurines everywhere. I mean, curios filled with little angel figurines. I mean, the cherubs and the, the I mean, ev everywhere. Pictures on the wall were about angels, carvings. I mean, angels were everywhere, which is great. I'm fine with angels, right? I, I like angels. I'm pro-angel, okay? Except when you are up in the attic at night and you got to get up middle of the night to go to the restroom and, and the only light you have to light your way to that room is this little night light in the hallway, which by the way was an angel, yeah. And so you're making your way down the hallway in the middle of the night, in the dark of the night with all these angels everywhere and this little light. So all these angels in the middle, it's kind of creepy. And so there are those who are like that. They are obsessed with angels. Angels are everywhere. But then on the other hand, there's another ditch. And that is those who would hold what I call a mission. Not angels are everywhere, but angels are nowhere. They don't exist. So these folks, angels are right up there with Superman, Spider-Man, Mickey Mouse. They, they're just part of a fairy tale, a figment of the imagination that was conjured up back in the Middle Ages to kind of help little children and simple-minded people uh, feel better on dark, stormy nights. I, I looked up years ago, and I checked it again this morning. It's actually a little bit better now than it was then. But 
Fox News conducted a poll several years ago, and they discovered that only 74% of Americans believe in the existence of angels. In other words, nearly one out of every four people deny the existence of angels. And so what we're going to do over the next several weeks, I'm going to do my best to bring some clarity and conviction to all the craziness and confusion surrounding the subject of angels today. So I hope you've got your Bibles with you this morning. I hope you've got a notepad. I hope that you've got a pen. This is one of those sermons that's not as much of an experience as it is an instruction. So get out some uh, notes and take some good notes this morning. I think this is going to be a blessing to you. The very first thing that I want you to write down is reason. That's the very first point, reasons. Well, why do a study on angels? I mean, just being honest, there are a lot of other things that we could study here in the middle of the summer that we could give our time to that, that might in some ways be better. As a matter of fact, we are going to do some neat studies. Uh, August is always that month that we spend on marriage and, and relationships and sex and that sort of thing. And, and even this morning, um, I, I came up with a title. And so we got to figure out how we're going to get this done. But in August, I'm planning on doing a series called Identity and Intimacy, What God Has to Say to a Sex Craze Confused World. And so we're going to be looking at that later on this summer, and then in the fall we'll be looking at what maybe what we believe and who's that sort. Of, so, but why give four weeks in the middle of the summer to the study of angels? I mean, why why are we going to spend looking at what the Bible has to say about good angels or fallen angels or demons? Let me give you several reasons that I think why we should. Number one, if you're taking notes, to increase our knowledge of the Word of God, to increase our knowledge of the Bible. There are over 273 references to angels in the Bible, and the the word for angel is used 108 times in the Old Testament, 165 times in the New Testament. Angels are mentioned 34 in 34 out of the 66 books of your Bible, 17 books in the Old Testament, 17 books in the New Testament. Abraham, Moses, Gideon, David, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Zechariah, Job, Daniel, Philip, Peter, Paul, James, John, and even Jesus, just to name a few, all talked about and encountered angels in their ministry. And so we're going to begin looking at the study of angels in order to increase our knowledge of the Word of God. But then number two, to provide comfort and assurance. And we're going to see, even beginning here this morning, how God assigns angels to deliver us from physical danger. Another reason, to increase our faith in a sovereign God who ex exercises control over the world and the universe through these ministering spirits called angels. Another reason, to increase our appreciation for God's holiness and righteousness. So you've got those angels there in Isaiah chapter 6, and they're before the throne of God. And they're shouting and singing back and forth to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We're going to see why and what they're shouting and singing. Another reason is to magnify the grace of God. And we're going to see that even though God could judge everybody all at once if he wanted to, and if he did, he would be well within his rights to do that, yet he patiently and lovingly delays. And then lastly, at least for this morning, to challenge us to a deeper Christian living and greater devotion to Jesus. And we're going to see that there, there is a whole world of spiritual beings that affect us either directly or indirectly. And so that's why we need to take our stand there in, I, in Ephesians chapter 6 against spiritual wickedness in high places by submitting and surrendering our lives to Jesus and resisting the forces of evil in this world through the power of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And so those are the reasons why we're going to be studying angels. Now here, here's the second thing if you're taking notes this morning, and that is the word reality. Angels are all around us. You say, well, pastor, I don't see them. Well, maybe you have and you just didn't realize it because remember what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says that some have unwittingly, unknowingly entertained angels. And so you're there in Hebrews chapter 1. That is our main text for today. And I have wasted all the time I can to give you time to get there. If you have not made your way there to Hebrews chapter 1, I just don't know what I'm going to do, okay? Hebrews chapter 1, notice what the Bible says down there. The Bible says, this is our opening text for today, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are they, and we know that he's talking about angels because it's mentioned up in the previous verse. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Ministering spirits to those who will inherit salvation. The previous church where we served for nearly 11 years, so 
I've been at Abilene now a little bit longer than I was at Temple. So Temple was a Mill Hill church. Is anybody familiar with that phrase, a Mill Hill church? Can I see your hands? A Mill Hill church. So in South Carolina and North Carolina, you had the textile mills, and these little towns grew up and communities grew up around these mills. And uh, <clears throat> the mill there in Simpsonville was the, the old Woodside Mill. It closed down in 1991. And so you had the meal, and then they would normally have a store. They would have a church, which was our church, Temple Baptist Church. And then they had the houses behind it that you would live in and rent from and pay rent from the meal. So you, the meal owned the store. The meal had the church. The meal owned the houses. You just worked and gave your life to the meal. And so, but there was a, a lady in the church named Martha Alexander. She was one of our senior saints. She was a homebound lady. She was sweet as she could be. She was crazy uh, and uh, in a good godly way. And, uh, and so Miss Martha was homebound there in one of the houses behind the, uh, the church and uh, she loved me and uh, she loved to sing and play the piano and the accordion and one night one night at 10 30 I get a phone call and it's Miss Martha on the other end of the phone and she never called me Pastor Brad she always called me Preacher Brad and so at 10 30 night so I pick up the phone and she says Preacher Brad I said hey Miss Martha she said what's your favorite song well, can I be very honest with you? At 1030 at night, I don't have one. <laughs> I, I just don't. But, but I, I pulled one out of the air. And I said, amazing grace. He said, all right. And all of a sudden, I heard the accordion kick in. <laughs> and she played every verse <laughs> of amazing grace at 1030 at night. And I sat there. You'd be so proud of me. I sat there and I listened. And then she got to the last verse. And before she started, she said this. She said, all right, preacher, I'm going to play the last verse and I'm going to hang up. And she, that's exactly what she did. She played the verse and click, hung up. <laughs> Miss Martha was there in her house back one day, middle of summer, 100 degrees, 100% humidity. Nobody else was there because everybody was out working. And she had walked to the end of her little concrete driveway or walkway and to get the mail, had her, had her walker, and somehow when she got out there and got the mail, she fell, and she couldn't get up. And she's laying on this concrete, this hot concrete on a 100-degree day, nobody around to help her, and she realizes, if I lay here very long at all, I'm going to cook to death. And then she told me later, she said, Preacher, a man that I have never seen before and I've never seen since, all of a sudden appeared out of nowhere, helped me to my feet, got me into my house, helped me dial 911, and I turned around and he's gone. You say, how do you explain that? I don't know how you explain it other than the fact that the Bible says God sends forth his angels to minister to his children. Sam Cathy, who preached here many, many, many times over the years. I was talking to Sam about this years ago, and he, he was talking about when he was a younger man, a much younger man. Hey, I think he was flying from Michigan uh, back to Oklahoma City, and uh, he had gotten to the airport a little bit early, and so he was hungry. If you remember anything about Papa Sam, uh, he loved hot dogs and Coca-Colas. And so he had gone down to find a restaurant in the airport to have a hot dog and a Coca-Cola. And uh, so he went down there, and, and he uh, was taking his time just enjoying that hot dog and that Coca-Cola. And all of a sudden, time got away from him, which it had a habit, have, had, have, it had a habit of doing. Uh, and so he realized, wow, I'm going I'm to be late for my plane. And so it's time. And so he gets up, and he runs down to the gate, and the door is shut. The plane is gone. And he tells the, the flight attendant or the gate, the gate agent there, and he says, I need to get on that plane. And he said, I'm sorry, the gate's closed. You can't go. The plane's gone. He said, wait a minute, i got to get on that plane. He said, well, I'm sorry. He said, matter of fact, i, I got to get on the plane. He says, you are on that plane. And Sam says, no, I'm not on the plane. I'm right here. And here's what the gate agent said. He said, I watched you get on that plane. I helped you make your way down there myself. And Sam tells the story. If it's, a, if it's a lie, it was his lie. Sam tells the story that the plane crashed. Now, I went back looking. There was a plane around that time from Michigan to Oklahoma City about that time that crashed. And I asked him, I said, what do you think? He said, here's what I think. I think God put an angel on that plane in my spot in order to protect me. 
You say, well, how do you explain that? I don't other than the fact, that, again, that God has his ministering spirits to take care of and minister to his people. So let me ask you a question this morning. As you look back over your life, can you remember those times when it was evident that God sent his angels to protect you? Can anybody remember those things? Can I see your hands? Maybe you were driving late out at night, wrecks on my cap. Yeah. And so some people say, well, pastor, I just got lucky. It was just a coincidence. It was happen chance. Look, you don't call God luck. You don't call God coincidence. No, right? A lot of people will talk about coincidence and happen chance when they ought to be saying God. God did this for me. God took care of me. God had his way. God had his will in my life. And what a great testimony it would be for us as believers if when things come into our lives that we can't explain that instead of saying I was lucky or happen chance or coincidence had it, that we would say loudly and boldly where our neighbors and our family and our friends and our coworkers and classmates could hear it. Look at what God did. Look at how God took care of me. Look at how he moved. Look at how he ministered in my life. The Lord did this. He rescued me from this terrible tragedy. He delivered me from this serious situation. He worked a miracle in my life. Wouldn't that be bring praise and glory and honor to our great God? I'll just be honest with you. As I look back over my life, there are times in my life where I'm just absolutely positive and, and certain that God protected me. And maybe he did it through one of his ministering spirits that we would call an angel. Why? Because I am an heir of salvation. Let me give you another passage of, of scripture to look at this morning. Turn over to Psalm 34 verse 7. Psalm 34 verse 7, we're looking now at why we believe in angels because they minister here on earth and they minister to God's children. But let me give you another verse to think about this morning as we take it a step further. Psalm 34 verse 7, the psalmist says that the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Now, it's great to be able to say, right? It's great to be able to say that the angel of God has been with me or the, the angel of God has been with you. But here in Psalm 34, verse 7, the Bible takes it a step further. And the psalmist says that he has given his angels to encamp around the child of God, to deliver the child of God out of the hand of the devil or some other terrible situation. But he tells us here in this verse that there is a very special, specific, particular requirement that must be true in the life of that child of God before his angel will do that. And you know what that characteristic is? Look at it right there. Those that fear the Lord. Those who fear the Lord. You know, are y'all still there this morning? What really limits the work of angels in a lot of people's lives is that they fear anything and everything except God. They fear family members. They fear peer pressure. They fear what the world would say or think about them. They fear anything and everything except God. There's no fear of God in their life. And yet the Bible says that the angel of God is going to work in the life of the child of God who fears him. One who has a holy reverence. One who has a righteous respect for God in their life. You say, well, Pastor... I I just don't remember. I don't think I've ever had any experience like that where God has, has sent angels to minister in my life. Well, you might have said more than you meant to say. Because that would simply mean that either you're not a Christian or if you are a Christian, you do not have a healthy, holy fear of God, a righteous respect and reverence for God in your life. See, I believe that angels are real because of their earthly ministry. They're active and real in our life. Here's the third thing that I want you to write down this morning. Number three is realization. And this is where you need to put on your thinking cap. There is a realization, a distinction, if you will, that we need to make as we begin our study on the subject and the presence and ministry of angels. And, and so the word angel is found, by the way, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word for angel found in the Greek and the Hebrew, it, it simply means messenger. That's just what it means. Greek is angelos. And you can even see it on the page. Angel, angelos, messenger. That's all it means. As a matter of fact, for some of you, this is going to be, it's going to blow your mind. So if, 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 so if, normally if you're that one who has that angel fetish that, that, that you just love angels. Normally you don't realize it, so maybe it's the person who's married to you that realizes, oh, you got a problem, quit bringing angels home, right? 
But this is going to blow your mind. Did you know that in the original language that the word angel is not feminine, it is masculine? Normally, we think of angels, we think of little fat chubby babies wearing diapers, strumming harps, sitting on a cloud, or we think of some really pretty lady, right? And yet, in the Bible, it is a masculine word. That blows my mind. Just be honest, I'm not sure that the word angel isn't so much talking about a person or a created being as it is the office of that one that God has created. So that brings us to this question. What is the ministry? What is the office work, if you will, of an angel? And I believe that we need to have an understanding, a realization, a distinction between the work of the Holy Spirit of God and the ministry of angels in the world today. Irv Andy was the, um, he was the custodian at Jersey Baptist Church when we were starting the church in Ohio. And uh, he was kind of an armchair theologian. And, and Irv and I were talking outside the church and on the por- front porch one day. And he said, I don't believe in angels. I don't believe they exist anymore. I think that anything that we would attribute to angels today is really just the work of the Holy Spirit of God. So here's what I would say to you this morning. If you've been around Abilene very long at all, you know that I'm not going to diminish the work of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, I, I've been called a Baptocostal. I believe in the person and the power and the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. I believe the Holy Spirit is real and active in this world today. But I also believe that what the Bible says is that God has sent his angels, his messengers, to minister to his children today. So that raises another question, right? What is the difference between the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the work of angels in the life of the child of God? And here's what I think the difference is. And I, know I want you to write these down. Pull your, get your Zaxby's napkin out there, something like that. Pull it out. Tear off the smudge part on the side. Write down, that here's what I think is the difference. Here is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who interprets and reveals the truth of the Word of God to you. Amen. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who lets you know that you're lost. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that makes Jesus real in your life. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who shows you that Jesus is the only one who can save you. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who seals you and indwells you and empowers you to do the will of God in this life. In other words, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is primarily spiritual in nature. That's why I believe that the Bible teaches that the work of angels primarily deals with the physical, material areas of our life. Remember back in, what, Genesis chapter 21? You have the story of Hagar. And there in Genesis 21, the Bible says that Hagar and her son were about to die of thirst and dehydration there in the desert. And the Bible says that she had laid her her son under a bush so that she wouldn't have to watch him die. And she had gone over on the side and she had sat down and began to cry. When all of a sudden the Bible says that God heard her cries and sent his angel. And here's what the angel said in verse 17. What ails you, Hagar? Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise and lift up the lad and hold him with your hand. For I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. That's in the Old Testament. Then you get to the New Testament. For example, Acts chapter 12. Peter is in prison. The Bible says beginning in verse 6 that Peter was sleeping. Bound with chains between two soldiers and guards before the door were keeping the prison. By the way, do you think they wanted him to stay? Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, (laughs) and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself. By the way, do y'all know what gird yourself means? So... Guys wore robes back then, and it's hard to run in a dress. At least that's what I'm told. I never tried it. This. <laughs> and so what you would do is you would reach down, grab the back of your robe, pull it up, and then tuck it into your belt so you could run. Gird yourself, tie on your sandals. So he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him. Just two examples, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament that seem to suggest that the work of angels primarily has to do with the physical material aspects of our lives as believers. And you even see this 
again, in the ministry of the law and the ministry of the gospel. The Bible tells us over and over and over again about the law, how it was delivered by the hand of an angel. Listen to these verses. Acts 7, verse, 63, verse 53, talks about those who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Galatians 3, 19 says, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Hebrews 2, 2. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. In other words, it is the law that has been written on tables of stone and delivered by the hands of angels. But it is the Holy Spirit of God who comes and ministers the reality of Jesus and the gospel to our heart. 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, clearly you are an epistle of Christ, literally a letter written by Jesus, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tables, tablets of flesh. That is of the heart. In other words, <clears throat> when we get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes into our life, and he doesn't write on tablets of stone like he did the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Rather, he comes and he writes the transforming truth of the gospel in our hearts. And it is the Holy Spirit of God who comes and makes Jesus real in the life of a believer. So the Holy Spirit works in the spiritual areas of our lives while the angels of God work primarily in the physical, material areas and aspects of our life. They're both important. They're both needed. They both have their place in our lives. And here's the last thing that I want you to see this morning as we get ready to close. And that, not just the reasons, the realization, but notice the response. How should we respond to what the Bible has to say about angels? Because there are some, maybe you're here this morning, I'm just going to shrug it off and say, big deal. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what all the fuss is about. I mean, Pastor, why, why are you giving four weeks of this? I mean, big deal. Kind of interesting. The story's kind of cute. But that really doesn't have much to do with me. And I hope that you won't say that. But why should we study angels? Are we going to study angels so that we can worship them? Absolutely not. The Bible says we're not supposed to worship angels. Anybody who worships angels is a heretic. We're not supposed to worship angels. Angels were not given for us to worship them. Angels were given to show us and teach us how to worship God. Revelation 2, beginning in verse 8 makes it really clear that we are never supposed to worship angels. John says, now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you don't do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Watch this. Worship God. Worship God. So when you boil it all down, what's the purpose behind this summer series of studies on these messengers called angels? I'll tell you what it is. We ought to study angels to learn how God uses them in our life and to learn from them how to worship and draw near to God. And we ought to study angels so that we might grow closer to the Lord Jesus so that Jesus might be magnified and exalted and made much of in our lives. That's what 1 Peter chapter 3 says in verse 22 when it says that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. When we get through studying what the Bible has to say about angels, if we are true to the text, if we are faithful to the Word of God, you know what it's going to cause us to do? It's going to cause us to do exactly what the angels do, to bow down and worship Him. To love and adore and exalt 
Jesus. To lift him up and make much of him. Maybe you're here this morning and this seems like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Crazy. And all that I've been talking about this morning about tablets of stone and written on the hearts of our flesh and <clears throat> angels, and all, it makes no sense to you. And it may be because you've never come to know Jesus. It might be because you've been a good person, raised in church, tried to live by the golden rule, but you've never come to know Christ. Did you know, and we're going to find out this more later, did you know that there's one song that the angels can't sing that you and I can. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Angels can't see that. They, they know nothing of the miracle of redemption that those of us who are Christians know, right? And if you're here this morning and you've never come to know Christ, you've never been saved, you could, you could experience that in your heart, in your life, before we stand up and sing before, definitely before you leave this place today.